It's The List and your boy with Jimmy Van and Sean Ross Sapp. All right, we are live. What's up, you guys? Sean Ross Sapp, managing editor of Fightful.com and FightfulWrestling.com. It is Wednesday, March 14th. It is time for The List and your boy, I believe, number 63. I've lost count, even though we have a counter. Me too. Remember Jimmy, remember Jimmy Van, you're back from Orlando. Oh, have I got a story for you, Sean. Oh, do you? Did you get hit in the face with a bat by Sammy Callahan? There was a hit. There was a hit. Ooh. So you're close. I, uh, You know how I, on occasion, like to tell a story here and there. You do tell stories. On occasion. <laughs> and I'm going to start by telling you a story, just because anybody listening to this podcast who has ever flown commercial, and I think everybody has, can relate to my story, Sean. For that reason, I'm going to tell it, and I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. So Monday afternoon, I flew home from Orlando, Florida to Toronto, Canada, on the lovely Air Canada airline, which used to be, I, 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 uh, I'll repeat, used to be one of the better airlines. <laughs> I got to the airport around 1 o'clock because uh, MCO in Orlando is one of the major uh, uh, airports, and it's very busy. So I got there two hours early for my flight. And when I got there, I couldn't help but notice that everybody in check-in was sitting on the floor. All the customers were sitting on the floor. And I thought, well, that's unusual. You know, what's, what's, uh, what's going on here? I talked to somebody there. It turned out the computer system for Air Canada went down. Couldn't check anybody in. Guy actually lied to me and said, but the plane is physically here. So as soon as it comes back, we're good, right? Well, that was a lie. The plane was not there. Uh, ended he up, lied. He lied. Yep, he lied. Ended up boarding at 7 p.m. So I was at the airport for six hours. Boarded at 7 p.m. Once everybody boarded the plane, it took a half an hour to close the door. And why was that, Sean? I posted this on Twitter. Why did it take a half hour to close the door? Because they were busy stuffing your dog in an overhead bin and killing him. I heard about that, too. That happened, <laughs> or making, Nigel. Or making I you saw flush that. your hamster down a toilet. Yes, and I heard about the dog one, which is very unfortunate, and, and that's another story. But uh, no, they, it took a half hour to close the door because they had too much carry-on luggage. Because Air Canada decided a few years ago their new policy was if you're sitting in economy, you no longer can check a bag for free. you got to pay for every check bag. And it's human nature to be cheap as fuck. Yeah. So everybody carries on. And so they had too much carry-on luggage. And until they could forcibly get people to check a bag, we didn't go anywhere. We didn't leave the ground. So that happened. Then when we finally landed in, uh, in Toronto... You have to understand, by that point, they had the delayed carriers coming in, plus they had the scheduled planes coming in. That caused a complete clusterfuck. Took a half hour to get an open gate, so we sat on the tarmac for half an hour. Then customs was completely chaos. I took about an hour. Then when I got to my car that was in the parking garage, Sean, by then it was about midnight or so, or 11.30. I was supposed to be there at 6 p.m. As you can understand, I was tired. It was snowing outside. I was a little bit grumpy not paying proper attention, hit the car next to me in the parking garage. No! Yes, I did. Yes, I did. As did I was backing get... out, not just not paying enough attention because I was tired and it was late, and I backed out and I hit the car next to me. So this is on your way home or on yeah. your way to Berlin? Okay. On my so way this home. Was in, this was in your vehicle? Yes, my SUV. Oh. Yeah. Man. So, yeah. What kind so, of damage did you do? I don't know. I didn't look because it was late and I didn't care. <laughs> what? No. Nope. It was late and I didn't care. And, uh, and so what I did was, you know, this is, this is one of those moments where you have an angel on this shoulder, Sean, and you got a devil <laughs> over here, right? Yeah. It's one of those moments. Yeah, and a little SRS <laughs> with, a, with a pitchfork. Yeah, uh, SRS is over here, and maybe Anna Bowert's over here. And, and you, yeah, think to right. yourself, you think to yourself, okay, you're supposed to leave a note. You're supposed to maybe take some pictures of the damage. I drove home, but... I called the parking garage at the airport and I told them everything, told them where the car was located, gave my contact information. So when the owners of that car show up, because who knows how long they're parked. You are on... admitting to a hit and run on our live show. I don't care. Oh I'm... my God. I admitted, I admitted, I, I'm going to pay the damage, whatever <laughs> damage there is. Insider trading, what's a little hit and run, you know? <laughs> okay. It was, park park it was a parked car. It was a parked car. Who gives a shit? It was a parked car. Oh, my God. Who cares? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> who cares? And it was an SUV, so there probably isn't any damage. Are we doing the stupid people segment early this week? What no. is going if I was going to be a stupid person, I would have just left and not said anything. And as a matter of fact, the girl on the phone, you know what she said to me, Sean? The girl, the girl on the phone said, I'm going to be honest with you. 
This is the first time that anybody has ever called and taken responsibility for hitting a car because they have that happen every day, Sean. Sure. Right? Oh, and she said, this is the first time anybody has ever called and taken responsibility. And I said to her, you know what? I've been, I've been fortunate in my life. I've been blessed in business. And I really truly believe, not that I'm going to get all sappy on you, Sean. I truly believe one of the reasons that I've been fortunate in business is because I believe in karma. And I believe mm-hmm. that what you dish out, good or bad, is going to come back to you in kind. And so I try to do things the right way. So that's why I called the parking garage and gave my own. Sure. So there you go. That was my Ky- Monday, Sean. Kyler James, our <laughs> social media manager, says, my dad got a DUI by hitting a parked car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, I'll they- just say this. I'll just say this. Kyler, all due respect to you. That's San Antonio. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> That's San Antonio. You know what? If the cops want to come to my office and give me a breathalyzer, I'm 100% confident I'm going to pass. So go ahead. Man. All right? No, but that's what happened. So my Monday absolutely sucked ass. One of the worst Mondays of my life. I, I, it's funny, too, because I said to my wife that day, man, I'm going to be home at 6 p.m. For the first time in months, I'm going to be able to watch Raw live in its entirety. Didn't see shit, Sean. Damn. That was my ever, Monday. Did you even- did you get to watch it at all? I saw some clips on YouTube, highlights. Yeah, that was it. So wow. that happened. Now, I got a few things to share with you uh, because I, I go to the U.S. a fair bit, and, uh, and a couple of fun things happened uh, this particular trip. The first one I posted on Twitter, let's, let's see Chester there, Nigel. Okay. Well, you've been to Orlando, Sean, correct? Yes. You ever, been, you ever been to a place called Gatorland? I almost did, but it rained the day I was supposed to go. Because remember, I was going to get you passes, right? Yeah. So Gatorland is a, is a park uh, close to where my in-laws live. It's an alligator park, and they've got other stuff there. And we go because my mother-in-law gets free passes, so uh, we checked it out because i got little kids. Why not? This was a ginormous alligator. Uh, the picture should be on the screen for our video viewers. They call him Chester the Big Dog Eater. And credit to my wife because I looked at this thing real quick. I looked at the sign, oh, Chester, that's nice, and I kept on walking. Credit to my wife who said, they call him the big dog eater. And I was like, oh, shit. It just didn't even click in because the nicknames are so stupid. It just didn't even click in. And uh, so I took that picture because and I posted on Twitter, hey, WWE, if you finally want to get Roman Reigns over since nothing else you do is working, there you go. Sign him up. Maybe that'll work. So I thought that was cool. And then the other thing I want to say about the U.S., so whenever I go to the U.S., I always love to try to, uh, a new cereal or a new cookie. Yeah that I can't get in Canada because the U.S. is a lot more variety. This time I well, found... Well, let's be honest. We're gluttonous. That's probably what it is. Probably what it is. But they always have unique stuff you can't get in Canada. This cereal that I found on this trip to Orlando is probably the most unique, unexpected cereal brand that I've ever come across. And I had to buy a, a, a box of it. Go ahead, Nigel. Is the image up on the screen? Yep. This is the Girl Guides Thin Mints Cookie cereal, Sean. Yeah, I've actually bought... Uh, a version of Girl Scout cookies that are based on Samoas. I didn't know it existed until yeah. I saw it. Really? Oh yeah. Any any excuse to cover things in sugar and eat them <laughs> is something that we do in America. It just yeah. It actually tasted pretty delicious. I'm not. See, my thing is I'm not big on mint and chocolate together. Okay. Here and there, maybe like huh? I could get like. One of those Hershey bars that has the peppermint bark in it and yep. stuff like that. Yep. And there was just one time last year I craved mint chocolate ice cream after never having it. I just felt like I needed to taste it. <laughs> Tried it. It was okay. Mm. But you're you're on the mint chocolate train. No, I'm I'm on the look for unique cereal train. No, that's that's fair. And uh, whenever we go to the U.S., I make a point, and I realize yes, I'm 43 years old. I make a point of going to a a, 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 a shopping mall or whatever in order to check out the cereal aisle of a place, and find something unique, and that's what I found on this trip. So I stick to Golden Grams when I do eat cereal. Golden Grams, Honeycomb, stuff like that. There you go. I want you to. Uh, oh, one other thing I want to mention. So last week on the podcast here. Uh, Because now we're doing more multimedia for our video viewers. Last (laughs) week, we posted a 30-second clip from SmackDown. I forget the gentleman that posted it on Twitter originally. But we posted a 30-second clip from SmackDown. And it showed something like 34 camera zooms and cuts in a span of like 30 seconds. Matter of fact, some people on our social media, when they saw that, said, Is this real? Like, did this really happen? And yes, it did. That was a legitimate clip from SmackDown. We put our own audio behind it. 
so that we could, you know, get around IP concerns or whatever. Within 30 minutes of the podcast airing, YouTube demonetized the episode within 30 minutes. And I wanted to mention this because uh, a lot of people these days, they're choosing alternatives over YouTube, such as Patreon. And this is the reason they're choosing them is because of decisions like this that YouTube makes. One of the girls that works for us, Melissa, actually said, Jimmy, if you want, I can uh, take that footage out and re-upload the podcast to get monetized. I said, yeah. forget it. Leave it the way it is. We won't get monetized for the week. Just leave it. <laughs> well, let's be honest. That's not how she reacted. When I no? said, she goes, no. <laughs> when I said, should we leave it? She said, no. So why did you ask me if I wanted <laughs> to change it? Because well, you're the boss, Jimmy. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Well, I, I said I mean, no. She said, it, she said it in the group chat, and then you were like, just leave it. Yeah, just leave and it. And in my mind, I'm like, thank God, that's so much editing. Yeah, no, and it, it told a better story the way it was. So. Yeah, so there's a lot of issues with that. Uh, we had Anna Bauer go to the New Japan Perth show recently, and a part of the deal in her covering that, you know, we pay people to cover events like this, was she would get us some clips and stuff. After she sent one in, I had to be like, whoa, don't send any, don't publish any on your page, or else you will get copyright strike after copyright strike. What WWE sent us was basically a soft copyright claim where they don't remove the video. They leave it up, but they take the profit from the video, essentially. Mm -hmm. At least that's that's how I'm I'm under the understanding that it works. New Japan has a bot that goes through and just tracks down anything that could be perceived as theirs and flag it and then copyright strike it. Keep in mind, we were credentialed media in New Japan Perth. I went through their PR department hmm. to get Anna there, to get her where she was, and to provide media and coverage. And it was like a two-minute clip that featured no wrestling, hmm. and it got copyright uh, copyright strike. But I'm happy to announce that moments before we went on the air, YouTube was like, nah, son. <laughs> get your video back and we verbatim, got a video verbatim back. nah son yeah the, the subject <laughs> was nah son and i said well that's interesting <laughs> interesting especially coming from japan oh no well, that was from youtube no, that was from youtube yeah all right all right uh tell the viewers quickly and listeners about uh the lucha underground season oh. cease and desist situation tell let's hear the whole thing sean so uh, Ryan sat in a pro wrestling sheet a couple of weeks ago, ran spoilers for Lucha Underground. Now, to go and attend Lucha Underground, they make you put away your cell phone and sign a non-disclosure agreement, which is commonplace. If you've heard of one lately, you're probably talking about a porn star and Donald Trump. But they do it for wrestling, too, apparently. I do it all the time, actually. I do yeah. NDAs all well, the time. Well, of course, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, in in a grand scale, that's probably where a lot of our readers, viewers have heard of them recently. But wrestling in 2018, they're doing it because Lucha Underground is in this episodic format, and they, they tape, and then they film and run shows over the next year, year and a half. Lucha Underground sent Ryan Satin of Pro Wrestling Sheet a cease and desist for running that and demanded that he reveal his source – and tried to somehow hold him to an NDA that he never signed. That he never signed and tried to get him to turn over his source that presumably did. Mm. Well, I'm here to let you guys know that your boy has the next set of spoilers. And we're going to run them on Fightful.com because we don't give a shit. No, 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 no. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. <laughs> The because truth. I the, have the most powerful lawyer in the world, me personally. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't care. The Who's truth is, the truth is, Sean said to me, "Can we run them?" I said, "Yes." He said, "What if we get a cease and desist?" I said, "I don't care." That's the truth. That's not necessarily the truth. That is the truth. <laughs> I was and, saying, "Come get me at the two three two three. Yeah, <laughs> find me. Yeah. My there office is, is off to the left as soon as you come in the door. There is a such thing as uh, freedom of speech, and uh, Ryan Satin did nothing wrong. If someone, if someone wants to give him information, that's on them, and I have no issue with this whatsoever. I have a very powerful uh, legal firm, and if they want to send me cease and desist, by all means. Not only will I be happy to receive it, I'll frame it and put it on my wall. <laughs> so it's all good. Would it be next to your uh, Ed Nordholm picture? Where is that? Um, come on! <laughs> Proudly displayed. Yeah, there it is, right there, man. 
And boy, do we have to talk about Impact Wrestling later on because it looks like they're continuing to make brilliant decisions. But we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Let's talk about the Fabulous Moolah controversy. Let's do it. I'm ready. I got to be honest with you, Sean. I don't understand how this is a controversy. Yeah, I do. Okay, let me let me explain myself. I understand her past. I understand it's, shall we say, checkered. I get checkered. that. I get that. The reason I don't understand how this Fuck is a controversy. Blood spattered is yeah, what whoa, it is. whoa, 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 hold on. The reason that I don't understand how this is a controversy is how we how have we not learned by now how Vince McMahon is? Have we not seen this a hundred times before? He re- rewrites history the way that he sees fit. He glorifies whoever he wants to glorify. He made a award after the Ultimate Warrior called the Warrior Award that wasn't even based on anything that the warrior himself wanted for an award. And he named it after the Ultimate Warrior, even though the Ultimate Warrior had a massively checkered past and, and said a lot of controversial things. JBL, who's one of the biggest bullies in the history of the business, always gets opportunity after opportunity after opportunity and network special after network special because he's one of the notorious Vincent Man ass kissers and laughs the loudest at every joke Vince ever says. So he gets every opportunity in the world. How is it this surprising to anybody that the fabulous Moolah is getting a battle royal named after her. How was this controversial? Well, I'll, I'll break this down as best I can. The warrior thing, I can at least believe that that is some sort of sick final troll on Jim Helwig by Vince McMahon to take a guy like the warrior who hated gay people and hated uh, Middle Eastern people and apparently, for some reason, hated paralyzed people and cancer patients and gave an award to cancer patients and paralyzed people that was named after him as a troll. I, I believe that. However, the Moolah thing, it seemed like they had taken a step back from that in recent years since since the, the notes about her and, and her past emerged. And that being said, those notes are that she would keep a ton of the money, would basically pimp out wrestlers, yeah. send them off to be raped, things of that nature. Some really, really sick shit. She was essentially like... I got more – you could have named it the Charles Wright Battle Royal, and I would have had more respect for it because at least he was up front about his character. And he let women stay on top of him for more than 2.9 seconds before he kicked out. <laughs> to love of God. <laughs> Fabulous Moolah sucks. She was never good. She intentionally would train women poorly so they couldn't show her up and get better bookings than her. She was just – miserable all around just a horrible horrible person and social media wasn't around back then uh jay had social media been around as prevalent as prevalently as it is now 15 years ago jbl would not be working for the company right now there's no way there are things i've been told off the record that uh would tell me he would never be there i even joked i was like what, are they going to do the John Bradshaw Layfield ass soaping in the shower pageant at next yeah. year's WrestleMania? Because that's how I feel it's coming up. Moolah's, it's just, it's gross. And I, you know, I think that Sherry would have been a better choice. And I had somebody say, oh, well, she thanked Moolah in her, her speech. Yeah, I don't give a shit. That, that bummer. But Sherry, despite the way that she died, a drug overdose. She didn't have those accusations hanging oh. over her. She didn't have the accusations of pimping people out. Sherry and, was awesome. I told you. Yeah, I, I spent a weekend with her. She was awesome. Not only that, former WWF women's champion, AWA women's champion, managed several wrestlers, uh, was a part of <laughs> her her reaction in the Booker T, the infamous Booker T Hulk Hogan clip, was enough for me. The way that she reacted – and she had to calm Booker T down. Yeah, and pat I was him like, on the man, shoulder, that, and yeah, like that's a pro. She's like, you got to calm yourself down. Let Stevie Ray get through this. Mm. It it should have been her. I saw a lot of people saying it should be named after China. Couldn't disagree more. China, no, she didn't want to work with women. Mm. She didn't want to sell for women. Not only that, I don't care if China was a porn star. Make your money how you want in that regard. But when you film a scene that has a Vince McMahon character and a Stephanie McMahon character, and there is incest in that scene, and you're out there doing a bunch of sex scenes with WWE's IP, I get the feeling, you know, maybe they don't want to do a battle royal after you. How many, time, fame, how many times did you watch that movie for journalistic research Oh, we, we were sent review copies. The, the company sent us review copies, and I was like, huh, 
and we we like did the sarcastic review of it. Now that being said, with all that sarcastic review, what, Nigel, it was it's still, hey, review. hey, hey, listen, listen, it was still nowhere near as funny as the uh, Tammy Sitch one, and that didn't have any like there was no comedy intended in that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, yeah, yeah. It's neither here nor there. It shouldn't be after China. It sure as hell shouldn't be after Moolah. I get it. They did the Mae Young classic. Yeah. But my and Mae, Mae, and Mae Young, with all due respect to Mae Young, Mae Young really had no career of any prominence except for the Attitude Era stuff. And and with the fabulous Moolah, I think a lot of today's fans only know her for the Attitude Era stuff. When she was a senior citizen taking bumps at the hands of the Dudleys and Jeff Jarrett, Otherwise, I don't know if today's fans really know anything about Moolah. The only thing I will say about the fabulous Moolah, and I'm not defending her past and her reputation, a lot of the stuff is alleged. we got to say that. It's alleged. But the one thing I will say is that in the territorial days, so in the 80s and the 70s and, and earlier than that, when it came to women's wrestling, the fabulous Moolah was the epicenter of women's wrestling. And back in the territorial days, if the promoters wanted to have a women's match on the show, they contacted the fabulous Moolah. Why? Yeah, if they wanted something else, they contacted the fabulous Moolah too. Perhaps, but I'm just saying. Why back the hell then, do you think she was so popular among promoters? She wouldn't train her women to do more than like hair pulling spots so often. So they wouldn't show her up. So they wouldn't take bookings from her. And uh, of course, when you're whoring off your wrestlers physically in more ways than one, you're going to be popular among promoters. Sure, I'm just kind of telling the facts. I mean, when it, when it comes to women's wrestling, she was the epicenter. Very much like Lord Littlebrook was the epicenter for little people wrestling back in the day. And oftentimes you went through him to get matches for that. And, and you went through Moolah for women's matches. So Did, did Lord Littlebrook make Max Minnie blow anybody? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think technically Max Mini was the next generation. Did, did he have Mini Vader out there turning tricks? That was a different generation. Technically, that was a different generation. <laughs> You'd be talking about uh, Little Tokyo, the Karate Kid. Uh, who else you was got, around then? Little Beaver. We're going to have to run a, a a little person wrestling podcast with all this knowledge you have. Oh, I, I remember I all that stuff. Yeah, Little Brook was the epicenter of that stuff. For, for a long, the, long time. I know the WWE, some of the WWE names and the mini, like the mini Mankind, the mini Vader that they would have here and there in the 90s. Now, granted, back then they called them midget matches, which you cannot say now. Yeah. But that's what they yeah. were called. That's what they were called back then. But uh, anyway, we can move on. But but again, when I when I heard about this Mula stuff, again, I understand her her you know checkered past and the, all the allegations that are coming out. But I don't understand the controversy just based on Vince McMahon's history of retelling history and of glorifying people that he chooses to glorify so based on that i don't understand the controversy but uh i guess it is what it is yeah i'm grossed out about it grossed out that they doubled down on it they just just name it something else it's not hard did you all have a big ass statue made for it or something probably i bet you they oh, will. well yeah scrap it who wants that thing? I bet they'll and, unveil it at WrestleMania. WrestleMania well, uh, Becky Lynch kind of sidestepped the question in, in a conference call. WWE will set up conference calls uh, for Indian media. And she kind of sidestepped it and just said, she was the most famous name for a long time, and that's why it's named after her. And then she deleted her tweet that was in support of Moolah that she, WWE had asked their talent to put up. So. Right, right. Yeah, I, I mean, I do remember yes. being a kid. I remember being a kid, and they would always, you know, put over Mula as like a, you know, a 20. She had a, a reign as women's champion of over 20 years and all that. And it's not until I get older and I start to learn the business that I understand. Well, that's because she was booking it. So it's easy to be uh, a 20-year champion when you're booking it. David Bixenspan, who actually did a good piece on Deadspin about the Mula situation, said, A friend of Sherry's told me the other day that the Hey Lillian line in her Hall of Fame speech was a troll and shot at Moolah for what it's worth. I don't know the extent of that. It's been 10 years since I've watched that speech, but yeah, yeah. I remember loving that speech too. Sherry was just... Yeah, Sherry was fantastic. Plus, hey, plus she kicked Jimmy Snuka in the fucking face. <laughs> there you go. Sherry hey, was... Sherry was the... To, sorry, I, go I was just going to say, Sherry was the first example of meeting somebody in person, like meeting a wrestling star in person and going in with a certain expectation... Because I had always heard that she was really tough and that she was old school and all that. And I yeah. came away from that weekend thinking she was the biggest sweetheart in the business because she was awesome. Yeah. So. Uh, and Jeff Jarrett earned that Hall of Fame ring by cracking Moolah over the head with a guitar. <laughs> so You're really anti-Moolah today, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I am anti-sex trafficking. You'd be shocked to believe. 
<laughs> I guess well, you learn something new every day about your employees. I mean, I, I kind of look at it like it'd be better if she was around to defend herself, I suppose. Is that these are all allegations. I'm not saying they're not true. Yeah. But, again, whatever. It's, they're allegations from 30 years ago. Yeah, so, or but longer. they still matter. They still matter. And, of course, I had that one guy who popped on my Twitter. Hate these SJWs. I'm like, she... Pimp people. <laughs> Sex trafficking. That's not red or blue. Mm. Come on now. There's no donkeys or elephants in this situation. We're going to move on and talk about Ronda Rousey before uh, right. before the first clip. So Ronda Rousey wasn't on Raw Monday night. WWE.com had claimed she was going to be on every Raw through WrestleMania. As it turned out, uh, Pro Wrestling Sheet reports that it was false advertising, essentially, that she was never scheduled to be on Raw this week. She was in Pittsburgh... Had- had people at the show backstage, wrestlers saying, where's Ronda? To me. Really? Yes, they didn't know. They didn't know. They didn't know. All right, well, apparently she was never scheduled to be there because she was in Pittsburgh doing medical testing. Uh, but she is scheduled to be at the rest of the Raws, the remaining Raws between now and Mania. I, You know the way I look at it? Not being on Raw every week is not the end of the world. You look at how they keep Brock special by not having him on Raw every week. They don't need to have Ronda on Raw every week. It keeps her looking like a special talent so i had no issue with it i they did a video package anyway so i felt like they really weren't missing anything by her not being there i would have just had her come out for the live crowd since you've announced that because the card subject the change they went really really overboard with that the last few weeks with live viewers because no brock no ronda if i am a paying customer there and i wanted to go there to see them right I mean, you know, they we talked about the crossover. There might be people who had never checked out a WWE show before say, Ronda's there. Yep. I'll check it out. That's true. And then... Then she's not there. Then she's not there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I had somebody texting me from backstage saying, where's Ronda? And I'm like, I don't know. Isn't she there? And they just said, nope. I said, okay. Hot dog, uh, reach out to WWE for comment. They said nothing. Yeah, they still haven't said anything official. They, I know that the article on WWE.com saying she was going to be at every ride, they very quietly took that down. Yes, they did. So that was so. Yes, I, I think maybe somebody screwed up because, again, she was never scheduled for Detroit. Some, somebody might have screwed and it, up. And it's funny because uh, right before it had been announced that Ronda was going to be on all these sh- all these shows – I had reached out to several wrestlers and backstage employees and people like that and said, how do people feel about Ronda? How, how is she taking to, to everything? They said that she is really liked, really popular backstage show is Travis Brown. And then I asked uh, most of those same people again when it was announced that she would be on every Raw. And they said, well, that, that's definitely a shot in the arm and a positive for her reputation. Mm-hmm. And then she wasn't on the show. So I'm going to reach out and ask some people how they feel about that as well. If that changes anything, uh, our own James Lynch talked to several UFC fighters about how they feel about Ronda Rousey moving to wrestling. And I'll tell you, the perception has changed among MMA fighters and pro wrestling since I've started covering uh, pro wrestling and MMA. It's just such a major shift. And take a listen to how some UFC fighters are looking at this. Best of luck to her. That, that, that's all I'll say is, 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 you know, she's doing what she do. Uh, and, and I never knock nobody's hustle. So best of luck to her. I'm not a huge wrestling guy, so, I mean, I don't really have much to say about it, really. Coming from a, a, an Olympic background, you you would want to see, you know, a little bit more of that competitive fire. You know, just to, just to say, if you are going to go out on your shield, you can go out a little bit, you know, you can go out a little bit better than that. But, I mean, hey, what, I, I ain't going to tell nobody how to live their life. Dude, she living her life. She, she happy doing what she do. Uh, and, and I wish all the power to her, you know, it, it might've been a couple, you know, she was, she was, I mean, Misha Tate hates her, obviously, you know, she, uh, Misha's one of my very good friends, but I don't, I don't have no hate for the woman. So, uh, you know, best of luck to her. A lot of people probably give Rhonda shit or some people, I don't, I don't know. She's probably gotten some shit from some, somebody, but they're dumb, you know, she's taking an opportunity and, you know, good for her. If I was Ronda Rousey, I don't give up and I try to back to the gym and train, train more and try to improve and back to UFC. But I think maybe she little give up and I think it's right that if she don't feel like she want to fight, fight more and fight again in UFC, so why not make good money also in the wrestling, you know? 
you know, it was cool to support her in her new venture and her career. You know, she's a pioneer of the sport. And uh, I feel like I feel like I was a small part of her new her new chapter. Just like I feel like I was a small part of it being there and being somebody that got to throw on a Rowdy Ronda Rousey shirt and cheer for her from the crowd. The only thing I needed was a couple beers, but I was in camp, so I couldn't get as rowdy as I wanted to. No pun intended. I saw her, you know, make her appearance the other day, and that was that was pretty cool. I was like, oh, that's you know, that's awesome for her. So you know, maybe I will pay a little bit more attention to it as she, you know, she gets in there and 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 gains that the WWE fan base. And you know, I'm interested to see how that plays out for her. I think it's good for her. You know, I rather see see her do something that's like active versus to like just sitting on the sideline and not doing anything. Because at the end of the day, she's still an athlete. And athletes, you know how they are. You can't sit them and be like, yeah, take this desk job because they ain't going to do that. You know what I mean? It's just not not mentally healthy for them. So I'm glad she's, she's doing something. I'm glad she's doing something. Man, I am so into it. And my kids, man, they saw it one day on TV and they started watching it. So now they're WWE fans. And then they saw Ronda and then that was it. So now they're the biggest fans. You know, you know we got to follow and You know, man, it's good for her, you know. She's got to make money, make money somehow, and, you know, doesn't have to get punched in the face, you know. It's tough, too, man, those guys. Like, you got to practice a lot for that, you know. And the kid, my kids see it, you know, they're fans of it. I got to watch it. And, you know, I support her, man. She's got to do what she's got to do, you know. Well, we know she's good at entertaining and entertainment industry. We know she she's she wasn't the best fighter, but, hey, she was entertaining. She, she Fighting wasn't for her. Maybe it could be, it couldn't be, but... Clearly, it's not for her. So hey, she she ran with the entertainment industry. And clearly, she's good at that, and that's how she made her name. So I'm I'm all on board with her doing what she's got to do. That's that's smart move for her. People are so quick to forget how great Ronda was, how much of a pioneer she is in the game. I mean, you think about from Dana going, there will never be women in the UFC, to then having her do what she did, and you know, women's MMA is is the the level is rising up so fast now. Is rising up so fast to the point where it's like, eventually, you know, the men is rising up as well, but they're rising up faster than the men's MMA did from like 1993. And yeah, the game kind of, I think, not left her behind, but just evolved faster because of her, you know, coaching staff. But going to the WWE, I think it's great. I think, you know, pal to her, enjoy yourself, fucking get that money, and fuck everybody else, do you. <laughs> Are, are we back? Yeah, we're back. Yeah, we're the guy's back. like, fucking get that money and fuck everybody else. Yeah. Just... <laughs> so, uh, Israel Adesanya is uh, rather, he's, he's a big wrestling fan, obviously. He made an impressive UFC debut recently. He was definitely rather outspoken in a positive manner towards Rousey's WWE run. And in a well, negative manner towards everybody else, but uh, in a positive yeah. manner towards Ronda Rousey. Fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask a question to Nigel. Sure. So, Nigel, let's say that you were a upper card talent in WWE. Okay. And you had main event potential. All right. If you if you hit the main events in WWE, you can make a very good living. Okay. All right. You go down to injury. You're out for a little while. You finally get medical clearance. The biggest show of the year is coming up in a couple of weeks, which is where you're going to make the biggest payday of your year. Right. And you decide uh, about a week... Yeah, three weeks before the biggest show, you decide, I'm going to get drunk, get behind the wheel of a car. How wise of a decision do you think that would be? I mean, I was I was with you right up, right there until the end. And then, uh, whew. Do you want me to coin, coin a term for this? What's that? I call that Hardy-esque. Hardy-esque, yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, see, I, usually, uh, usually Jeff waits until his run is over. Right. Then he's like... Give me the shit. <laughs> you know what I, mean? <laughs> I, uh, I heard about this one while I was in Florida. And my only reaction was, so what else is new kind of thing? And that's unfortunate because you look at a guy like Jeff Hardy. It's clear to Vince McMahon because, again, everything is about Vince McMahon. And it's clear to Vince McMahon that Jeff Hardy is the star of that brother team. doesn't matter that they're doing Broken Matt and that they're doing Ultimate Deletion and they're doing all this stuff. To Vince McMahon, Jeff Hardy is the star of that team. That means that when he's cleared to return, he's the one that's going to get singles opportunities. He's the one that's going to get a chance for main events. It's Jeff Hardy that's going to get that. 
So what does yeah. he do when he finally gets clearance and he's got the biggest show of the year, three weeks three weeks to go? He gets a DWI in North Carolina. Shit. What an idiot. There, there's no other way to put it. And, and granted, WWE uh, does not have anything in their wellness policy about DWI. We know that Jey Uso was arrested for DWI, I think, in January. He never got any kind of WWE punishment out of that. Uh, WWE released a statement saying, Jeff Hardy is responsible for his own personal actions. We're investigating the matter and awaiting information from local law enforcement uh, officials. So it's possible nothing's going to come out of it. But he already had a reputation. He did a little bit of jail time. I think it was 2011 for cocaine possession. He's only a year back in the company, less than a year back in the company, coming back from medical leave, and now he, ha he has a DW. It's just so stupid. It's so stupid. And, yes. and if, anything, if anything, if he still now gets elevated to the main events, what does that say about uh, the way that you treat your talent, the way that you handle your talent's actions outside the ring? I saw somebody say, it wasn't Jeff, it was Itchweed or Willow the Wisp. Right, right, or Neo. Or Neo, yeah. Ne yeah, that, what, what else can I say? It's dumb. and So the, stupid. It's dumb on WWE's part to not have a policy for this too because you shouldn't be just letting your talent get behind the wheels of cars messed up drunk fucked up yeah uh <laughs> i'm gonna circle back here to a topic we were just talking about because i just got an email uh -huh. and it says the the subject is infringement and it uh -huh. says hello this youtube channel violate violates your copyright laws i click the link and some russian youtube channel has one of our mma pros picks videos oh. with a different thumbnail uploaded twenty three thousand views My response you is leave it there. Fuck. <laughs> so help me God, I will come over there and break my foot off in your bot asses. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that 23,000 views, you're not going to get any revenue out of that. But uh, whatever, bit. whatever. Get a little bit out of it. Not much. It's probably all Russian traffic. You're lucky if you get a quarter of a cent per. <laughs> I don't care. They're going to get They're gonna get a quarter of my foot. Oh, my <laughs> That's what they're getting. <laughs> So let me ask you this, Sean. You know how uh, we've talked in the past, or at least I've talked in the past, about how to me the WWE Hall of Fame is just a marketing ploy and how uh, WWE uses this to get mainstream attention, my opinion, and they use it as a moneymaker, and it means a lot to some of the talent. Doesn't mean... No, you've never, never said that. Oh, no, I've never said that. Never said that. I, 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 I compiled something this morning, and I just want to run this by you. So when Goldberg, uh, when it was announced he was going into the Hall of Fame, WWE let ESPN break the story. And they made a point of saying, I was broken by ESPN this morning, when the Dudley Boys, when their announcement was done, it was done by CBS Sports. When Jeff Jarrett's announcement was done, it was done by NBC Sports. When Ivory's was done, it was done by ESPNW, which is uh, the women's version of ESPN. When Hillbilly Jim's was done, it was done by Bleacher Report. In every single case, WWE made it clear on television and on the website as broken this morning by ESPN, yeah. CBS Sports, Bleacher Report. This week... Billboard.com broke the story that Kid Rock is going into the WWE Hall of Fame. How telling is it as to Vincent Mann's true motives for the WWE Hall of Fame when every single inductee going in had it broken by a different mainstream news outlet this year? How, oh, and, how clear and, is that? And Brad Shepard reported, like I think, 80% of these names in December. Right, right. <laughs> and he's, he's a wrestling wrestling guy, so... That's not who really broke them, and I've been lucky enough to not have them do that with any of my stories, because if they did, I would probably throw a fucking fit. I was gonna say, if but they did, you would do nothing. And uh... I, would, no, I, would throw, I would throw a fit. I would throw a goddamn You'd fit. You'd shake and your would... fist on the podcast. Yeah, you damn right I would. <laughs> kind of like and the Simpsons episode. Russian pieces of shit. You know the Simpsons episode when they stole the lemons from Shelbyville? And the, the father says to his son, shake it more, boy. Yes. Shake your fist more. Because that's literally all that you could do. But I'd to me. Training. I'd have the shake weight here ready. I'd, yeah, I'd be yeah, prepared yeah. for Wednesday. <laughs> no, I'd hit up their PR department and I'd say, the fuck? It's so clear, though, that this whole, this whole, thing is about, whole thing is about getting mainstream attention. When you look at that list of how every single talent, they gave the story to a different news outlet. All seven of them. It's so obvious this is a mainstream marketing ploy. And uh, so I, I just, because I, I heard about the Kid Rock thing and I heard Bill, you know, as broken by billboard.com. And that made me go back and look, who broke all the other ones? And everyone was a different outlet. 
So it's it's very clear what they're doing. Uh, well, we've seen their their attitude towards wrestling journalism and how they prefer to do things. And I had that big thread about how they prefer to feed interviews to certain people yeah. or certain markets. If you're a wrestling journalist in India, you might get some interviews. You might get on a call because they want that area really bad. Yep. In America, they just they know that everybody, like all the free sites, have to cover almost everything because that's the only chance they get to have those articles up there. Right. Um, you posted something on Twitter this week. Uh, and this is a quote from you. There could be 19 title holders in WWE shortly after WrestleMania across four brands. How do you feel about that? And this was on the, on the heels of NXT announcing the introduction of the North American Championship. And then there, yes. are, there are rumors that there's going to be cruiserweight tag team champions. There are rumors that there's going to be women's tag team champions in WWE. Uh, but the North American title is, is official. Um, what do you think about now, when you say the four brands, you mean Raw, SmackDown, NXT, and 205 Live. What do yes. you think that there are now, with the North American title, 19 different title holders across the four brands? Well, it makes me think if they do women's tag belts, those better be floating titles. And I mean floating NXT, SmackDown, Raw. Like, good God, you can't just have those on every single brand. The NXT North American Championship, I thought, I think it's funny because, you know, EC3 is still on Impact Wrestling. And he's yeah. doing the Feast or Fired deal. And yeah. they're like, what kind of briefcase will he get? And I'm thinking, probably the one with an NXT North American Championship <laughs> match in it. Like, that's probably the one he's getting. They have the United Kingdom title. NXT Tag Title, NXT Women, NXT Championship, SmackDown and Raw Tag Titles, US, SmackDown and Raw Women's Championship, the WWE Championship, Intercontinental, Cruiserweight, Universal, and as you mentioned, they're talking about bringing Cruiserweight tags in. I don't like the idea of a Cruiserweight tag title mm -hmm. because and I'll tell you a little bit of what, what I've heard about 205 Live in a minute, but New Japan is at the point where for the last year or so people have been – I say people, but a lot of people have been saying, just combine the divisions right. because they have, they have, you want to talk about way too many titles. New Japan has way too many titles and the young bucks are leaving the division. They're, they're heavyweights now. Mm -hmm. What are you, what are you going to do? What's going to anchor that division? Just put them in there. Mm -hmm. The styles clash is good. That is, I, I'd like to see Hideo Itami and Akira Tozawa take on uh, Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson. I want to see that match. I want to see – I don't want to see the same sets style of people, all the time, yeah. same, same styles all the time, yeah. yeah. As far as 205 Live and then possibly adding cruiserweight tag titles, I was told that um, – because I asked following a Dave Meltzer report they were going to run more live events, uh, I asked the same person who is connected with 205 Live how – what the direction of the brand is, and he said it's the same it's been for the last year. They're trying really, really, really hard to build it and put marquee names in there, but people keep fucking up. People keep messing up. They would have had Neville, Aries, Swan, and Enzo mm -hmm. on that brand right now if they had their way. Mm -hmm. And they said they're going to try to – they've tried to separate it and make it more of the internet's show. And it's catching some buzz. There's, I see people talking about it saying it's the best wrestling show the WWE has, and it is. It is – it's really, really good, but they they are all in on it, and I, I was told that we should look for them to bring up more names uh, to that roster very soon. When I look at all those titles, I think about pro boxing, and you could even say MMA now too because UFC keeps on creating titles in, in UFC. Yeah. It's been proven through the numbers. You look at box office numbers. You look at television ratings. It's been proven. What draws in boxing is not title matches. What draws in boxing is marquee matchups. And the same mm -hmm. thing with the UFC. What draws in the UFC is not title matches. What draws in the UFC is marquee matchups. Wrestling's no different. What draws mm -hmm. in WWE now is marquee matchups. That's the reason why AJ Styles versus Shinsuke Nakamura, which is for the WWE title, and which 15 years ago would have far and away been the main event, WrestleMania 34, it's going to be number three mm -hmm. or four on the card in terms of marquee value. And that's because it's going to you know, take second place or it's going to take... Uh, uh, back burner status over the marquee matchups. Ronda Rousey's match is going to go above it. Cena Taker's going to go above it. And probably Brock Roman Reigns is going to go above it, even though the WWE title is supposed to be the marquee title in the company. So uh, I, I, I just I agree with you. I think there's too many titles. The titles don't really mean anything anymore. The fans have been trained to not care about the titles. And, and it's overkill. There's no need for all of it. 
Pete Dunn has de- has defended his championship like five or six times on TV in the past almost year that he's had it, and that's more than some do. But yeesh, man, that that's an awful lot. It's it, and I'm. I'm okay with the idea of an NXT North American Championship because it's a secondary title for NXT. But what's the United Kingdom Championship? No, that can't be it. That's true. That's true. Could now be. I get, I get it. They want, they want Pete Dunne to go defend it on Progress and all that crap. But my God, man. Yeah. Also, the North American Championship. Our buddies over at Pro Wrestling Unlimited, they do the Fightful Wrestling Weekly video, and one of their, their hosts, Nick had an NWA North American Championship replica that I didn't even know they made. <laughs> I didn't even know that was in existence. I'm That's... about to call up my buddy Tim Storm and tell him that Nick stole his shit because there's no way they, that they sold any of those things. You but, know, maybe uh, maybe that's another reason why they create titles is, is to sell the merch. That You know, that's that's not a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, hey, they they knocked it out of the park with that UK championship. That is a beautiful title belt, I thought. But right, and right. the newer NXT championships, I think, look pretty good as well. But oh man, just too many, too many. Especially when you got something that looks like that United States Championship. Bring back the NWA United States Championship. That was a beauty. Bring back the black strap for the Intercontinental title. Really? Please. You don't like the white? No. Well, as long as they don't bring back that crappy oval design they had. Yeah, no, stick idiot. stick with this one because it's the classic one, but with the black strap. The white strap reminds me of the Ultimate Warrior. Here's a fun fact for you. Chris Jericho has held that title more than anybody, the Intercontinental title. Mm-hmm. Never held the version that exists right now. The classic version. He uh, only held the, the Attitude Era one. And if you remember, I, I think what, they, what it looks like now is the best it's ever looked, whether regardless of strap, but... When Cody Rhodes brought it back, they had those weird side plates, and they mm. tried to update the design. And I'm like, no, you all had the one that worked. They had the one that worked to it such a degree that ECW ripped it off for their tag titles, and the NWA ripped it off for their North American Championship. So I it's still just one wish of the best times ever. I still wish they had the Winged Eagle Belt for the WWE title belt. I love that. I thing. love that belt. That was a good I, belt. Yeah, uh, I thought that TNA had a great looking championship in like 2007 2008 ish i think it was the one that kurt angle won after they stripped the nwa stuff all from it then they switched to that ugly ass just big tna yeah oh because they tried to be like wwe and they wanted to brand it and all that stuff but really they tried to be like wwe man that's a shocker i was actually uh i had planned to interview the guy from wildcat belts and i will still because I want to talk to him. He creates a lot of the belts for people these days. and I want Yeah, to like the Aware Ads Championship. I, yeah. Uh, let's see. He created this sucker right here. Do you ever defend that, you lazy um, part-timer? Well, I told you if I did defend it, I guarantee you I'd win every time. I so. think that if you and Luke defended them against Melissa and Lindsay, they're going to win. You think so? I think so. I think Lindsay laid down. Mania, book it. I think uh, Lindsay would lay down real quick. I would just show her a T4. They don't. Have, I don't think they have T fours in the U S. Do they? No. Oh, it's like it's like the the tax. We have T two Judgment Day. <laughs> <laughs> shout out! Shout out to my friend Randy Cruz, who's running the '90s movie March Madness tournament right now. I got Home Alone or Terminator Two going all the way. That's the perfect segue to stupid people, Nigel. <laughs> yeah, there we go. This is a stupid song, it just goes on and on. You might find some meaning, but you would be wrong. All right, thanks to TrevorStrong.org for the usage of the song. We actually have an update on a story to start this week, Sean. Hot dog. This was sent to us via podcast listener, and this is their Twitter name, XXXETown on Twitter. They, they they do it on Twitter. <laughs> they follow. I'm just Obviously telling the facts. Us. I'm just telling Obviously the facts. Us, it's not too off to a good start. So this is an update on the young fellow that wouldn't poop because uh, he had swallowed allegedly drugs, and the police were waiting for him to poop it out so that he could be uh, arrested. And when I told the story last week, at that time he had uh, held it for 37 days. So Sky News reported on March 7th that the young man had to be released because he got up to day 47 and 
after day 47, the police were, uh, were told that he needed to be released on, quote, medical and legal advice. And so he was released on bail and taken to hospital for treatment. So he got off, Sean. Wow. Maybe in more ways than one by the time he got to the hospital. Now, here's, <laughs> here's what I want to know. Did he poop? Well, I don't know. All I know is that he went to the hospital for treatment. I'm going to go ahead and guess his first night in the hospital, he let her rip, Sean. That's what I'm guessing. At some point, I wonder if he like had to get it surgically done, like if it just created a big, <laughs> a big egg. Could have been that. <laughs> <laughs> a big Cadbury egg, drugs and feces. Very possible. Very possible. Are you familiar with Fatberg, Sean? No, I'm not. I know Nigel because Nigel knows everything. So Fatberg was basically in the London sewers. And it was a blob of essentially uh, fat, used diapers, used wet wipes, everything that had been getting flushed down the toilets and down the sink. And it built up in the sewer to the point that this thing was like a, it was the size of an iceberg in the London sewers. And it took them something like two months in order to get it out of there. They had to take it out in pieces. And it took something like two months because it clogged up the sewers. And they actually kept a chunk of it in a museum in London for people to look at. They called it Fatberg. This dude would have shitberg up his ass <laughs> after 47 days. You know? Man, that is just painful. Painful to even think about. Like I said last week, we can't go 47 days without talking about shitting. No, On we can't. On this show that runs once a week yeah. for 90 minutes. Well, we talk about it every week, for sure. Every week. It's an important topic. It is. Let's, uh, <laughs> this first story, Nigel, put up the, uh, the, the leg. Sure. So this was reported by the Washington Post on March 13th. This is, people are so sweet. So a 28-year-old man in India had to have his leg amputated after a car accident. Two nurses and two doctors tended to him in the hospital, and they decided that they needed to prop up his head. Well, he was laying on a stretcher. They needed to prop up his head, oh. and I, I guess there was no pillow handy, so they propped up his head with his own severed leg. And we have a picture of it. And what ended up happening was the man's relatives went to the hospital to visit him, saw him laying on a stretcher with his own amputated leg being used as a pillow, took pictures and video of it, told the local uh, news outlets, uh, word got back to the hospital, and those two doctors and those two, those two nurses were suspended. Oh, you th yeah, you have to. <laughs> Can you believe that? How does that happen? That is gruesome. Yeah, yeah. Vincent Mann's about to name a battle royal after those those doctors yeah. like my god or maybe after the leg the disrespect <laughs> it's leg. insane yeah it's insane but they they actually did it this Abused. next one now it could be argued that this next one could be part of the sean ross Ra, sean ross app file for different reasons it could be argued uh this is the uh, japan one nigel yeah yeah i figured this see he already knew <laughs> this was reported by sora news 24 on march 8th a Japanese sounds credible. Uh, oh, it's real. <laughs> There's photographic <laughs> it's, evidence. It's too real. It's real. A Japanese manufacturer called Nikos is launching a line of hats for your cat, like a cat. So the line of hats that they're launching features cat ears. The name of the line is called Colorful Cat Fluffy Cat Ears. <laughs> All right, Natty's got to sue. <laughs> Daddy's got to sue them. Uh, so, yeah, it's called Colorful Cat Fluffy Cat Ears. They have, simple. they have such official uh, color names as Lemon Yellow, Scarlet, and Violet. And it is essentially a cat hat for your cat to look like a cat. <laughs> which which cat did you find the cutest of those that were on there? Uh, I mean, they, the, I'm going with the gray in the top right. They had a whole bunch. I don't recall which is which because they were just all stupid. But, uh, but that that happened. I thought of you immediately, and I thought there's a perfect gift idea for Sean Ross. They're Sapp, super right there. cheap too. You know? Oh, of course they're super cheap. Yeah. It's a Japanese manufacturer. <laughs> yes. There you go. This last one, Sean. You're gonna like this because this ties into what we've talked about recently. So you're gonna like this. So this was published by the Dallas Observer on March 7. This is not a stupid person's story so much as it's a stupid topic story. But it still yeah. matches the Sean Ross Sapp file, and I'm gonna explain what I'm talking about. So you, uh, over the last few weeks, have been talking about wrestling journalism. And you've yeah. been talking about the hardships of wrestling journalism, right? When it comes especially yeah. to dealing with WWE. There's a writer for the Dallas Observer by the name of Jim Schutz. 
He's been a journalist for 46 years. And he wrote an article for the Dallas Observer talking about the evolution of journalism and how newspaper subscriptions have dried up and everybody's going online and the money that you make as a journalist is, is you know, gone down the toilet. Then, in a very sarcastic way, because clearly he's a little bitter, in a sarcastic way, yes. he talked about a story that was in the Dallas Morning News on March 5th, and the headline of that story, and this is a direct quote, where does our poop and pee go in Dallas? Curious Texas investigates. That was the subject of the story, and this guy wrote an article about that story saying sarcastically, this is what's going to save journalism. Stories like this and topics like this is going to save journalism. And I thought of you because I thought, well, there you go. This guy thinks that shit stories are going to save journalism. I'm making a good living off of it. There you go. (laughs) I'm doing all right for myself. There you go. There you go. Yeah, I mean, hey, you can be bitter all you want, but... I started off just doing articles and writing articles, and then I saw the opportunity for video. I was telling Nigel off the air. I, when I worked for another website, there were no live video raw reviews right. then, and we were like, let's do one. Let's do it. Let's pivot. Let's let's attack that market. You got to be open to doing different things. That's why uh, journalism schools, they like my the, the school that I went to went from journalism to multimedia journalism. Then when I was there, they switched it all up, and the major became – Convergent media because you need to learn how to do a little bit of everything. There you go. There you go. Even write about poop and pee. Is CM Punk still uh, newsworthy in terms of pro wrestling? Yeah, he sure he, is. He still is. Okay, I know that you know the Young Bucks talked about getting him for their all in show and all that. So Dana White, the uh, head of the UFC, even though he has long claimed that I will not give these celebrities if they want to fight in the UFC, I will not give them a gimme fight. And his long claim, you know, Brock Lesnar had Frank Mir first time up, which is pretty tough. Punk had uh, uh, Mickey Gall, who was a pretty good fighter. You know, he, yeah, that, been that, training, been training for eight years at that point. Had him the first time up. Uh, James Tony had uh, Randy Couture, which is definitely not a walk in the park. <laughs> that being said, it's a different time in the UFC. The UFC is at a, at a place where they're having trouble finding those marquee matchups. Their pay per view buy rates are in the toilet. As a result of that, my opinion. Uh, they're giving CM Punk a, a gimme fight, at least it should be a gimme fight, on uh, June 9th at UFC 225 in Chicago. He's going to be fighting Mike Jackson, who is 0-1 as a pro, just like Punk is. Uh, Mike Jackson hasn't fought in over two years, and his his fight, his loss, was to Mickey Gall, the same guy that beat CM Punk. Yeah. And I know that's why they're doing it, because there's a story there, I suppose. Uh, maybe the winner's going to get Mickey Gall in a rematch. I can see that happening. But... Um, to me, this is a, a gimme fight. If, if, in my opinion, if Punk doesn't win and win decisively, that should be it for him in the UFC. My opinion, oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, without a doubt. He's yeah. got to win. And to be honest with you, I think no matter what, it's it for him in the UFC. Even if he wins? You think so? Yeah, I think he's done. I think I just think if I were him, I would go out with that win. I would come back to pro wrestling. But maybe he doesn't want to. If he doesn't want to and he's that thrifty with his money, which – Apparently he is. I'm told that he spends his money uh, very, very well or safely and has plenty saved. However, WWE lawsuit, I know they're they're really going after Colt Cabana and they're causing him some issues. So Mm. you never know what will make you need money. I mean, the all-in show is a car car ride for him, man. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, you know. What are are your thoughts on them doing the – the weekend ordeal where it's like a whole weekend thing. They're running like a podcast convention there. To me, with all due respect to them, and I think it's smart of them to do it, I think it's a way for them to get people that are covering them to pay them. That's exactly why they're doing it. Yeah. And I mean, good good for them if they're going to do it. Sure. Every one of those podcasts is going to plug this every show. Yep. That's why they're doing it. Because, I mean, it's, it's a part of their investment too. They're investing in the show, in themselves, and in All In. Which I think that's a slippery slope. Like, will I go there and cover it? I might go there and cover it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's my birthday weekend. We'll see how that goes. But as far as setting up a booth and all that stuff, I think that's a slippery slope when you're, when I'm a wrestling journalist, yeah, and I'm investing in a wrestling show essentially. Conflict because that's interest. what that is. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, a, it's a big conflict of interest. Yeah, yeah. However, when you've got some shows that aren't really worried about that, I mean, not every show is a journalistic has has somebody that's a journalist on it have i mean with 
with all due respect to Dave Meltzer, because you know I have a lot of respect for Dave Meltzer, he has very publicly, he very publicly always puts over the Young Bucks. Yeah. He very publicly always puts over those guys. And it's because they're big fans of his. They named a move after him. And so everything they do is six star or seven star, or 12 star, 83 star. Yeah. And he doesn't really hide it. And, uh, you know, whatever, whatever. Let me ask you this question. What the hell is going on with Austin Aries? Man, he's everywhere, isn't he? Is he done with Impact Wrestling? No, no, he's not. You uh, sure? He, um, yeah, he's he's got the free agent deal. He can do what he wants. He's their world champion right now. Okay, let me ask you this question, and I, I'm, I'm putting my business hat on for a second with this. I understand the benefit to Impact for him to show up on the Ring of Honor 16th anniversary show. For Impact, that's a benefit because Impact is the little bottom feeder promotion right now. Ring of Honor is high up on the totem pole. They have more exposure. They have a bigger fan base. So you're hoping that your bigger champion, backing too. bigger backing too, you're hoping that your champion can grab some of those fans and bring them to Impact Wrestling. So for Impact, it makes sense. And maybe this is another example of them being lenient with their talent, like we've seen where they're letting guys keep the IP and all that. That's fine. If you're Ring of Honor, what is the benefit unless he's no longer with Impact and he just took the belt with him because I could see him doing it and he signed a contract with Ring of Honor. Unless that has happened, if you're Ring of Honor, what is the benefit of having this guy on your show who's going to take whatever rub he gets off your show and bring it to another show? What's the benefit? Having a guy who was on a WrestleMania show last year in a title match being on your... I thought they were going to run it Super Card of Honor. I thought that was going to be the night they did it, but apparently they have Kenny King versus Silas Young booked. If I were them, I'd be putting Austin Aries, Impact Champion, in a TV match, a TV title match on that show. But it's just a, just another marquee name for them, at least in at that level. He's not the the level of marquee that he ever was he's not. in the years before, but he's a hell of a name and he can wrestle. So that's really the benefit. And if they're okay with it, I, I would trust their judgment a little bit. Impact is just like do whatever we can to bring in somebody. That's what it is. You, for them, yeah. you want you want the the rights to your name? Take it. Whatever. Have it. Just come here. I mean, Russell he had he had the belt there. with him. Now they they never yeah. referred to him as the Impact Champion, but he had That's the true. but he had the belt with him. He had several with him. He, he had did because like he, yeah, he's doing the Ultimate Dragon gimmick. So 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 he's got yes. all the belts that he's won. I get that. But uh, I just I just look at it again. If I'm Joe Coff, the the CEO of of, of Ring of Honor. Austin Aries isn't on my show unless you sign a contract with me. That's that's what I would do because you're investing time and money into him, having him on your television, and he's then going to take that and he's going to translate it over to Impact. There's no benefit. So I, I wouldn't have him on the show unless he signs a contract. Yeah, and it's funny because you'll hear from Taya in a bit. I don't want to segue in there yet, but I talked to Taya about this partnership between Lucha Underground and Impact because a couple of years ago, if you remember, it wasn't all thumbs up and sunshine and lollipops between mm-hmm. Impact and and uh, Lucha Underground. In fact, Kenny King fell victim to all this because when he was a part of that hot BDC angle that they were doing back then, one of the rare hot angles that Impact had, it got scrapped because Hernandez appeared on Impact in that angle without getting clearance from Lucha Underground from his contract, and they had to scrap all that footage. Right, right. And then then they lost like a good portion of their roster because of it. So the fact that Impact has worked to repair some of the bridges that were burned before then, oh, they want to build that that new Japan bridge too. You better believe they do. That's why they that's another reason it's good Don Callis is there. But the way that they treated Okada and the way that they changed a new Japan title without telling New Japan that's not good for business. Mm-hmm. And I think that Don Callis and Scott Demore are just trying to – they're trying to build goodwill. I, I get their perspective. I don't understand Ring of Honor's perspective. Yeah. Oh, I, hey, I'm with you. Yeah. But I think it's just a marquee name for maybe one show. I haven't heard the contract status of Austin Aries. I'm working to find out. But uh, if it's for one show, sure. If he he manage, wasn't at the TV tapings. so Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is puzzling yeah. a little bit. Like, I, I mean, we'll was see. he, was he, was he just there and he, I mean, he said, wasn't, hey, go he out wasn't there. you, oh, you mean at the pay-per-view? Yeah. Maybe. Hey, go out there and point at the title. Okay. Yeah, whatever. maybe, maybe. That was Vegas, wasn't it? Yeah. Where does he Sam live? Southside. Where does he live? I don't know. Okay. Uh, so you've been talking for a few weeks about how the bar needed challengers for WrestleMania. I'm putting you over here, Sean. You've been talking yeah. how the bar needs challengers for WrestleMania. 
and you suggested <laughs> that Braun Strowman, you suggested that Braun Strowman was either going to try to challenge them by himself or he was going to grab Elias and say, hey, I need a partner and you're my partner kind of thing. That was your suggestion. On Raw this week, they had a tag team battle royal to earn the right to challenge the bar at WrestleMania. And what happens? Braun Strowman won it by himself. Sean, are you on the creative team of WWE Raw? <laughs> yeah, they wish. They wish. That's um, basically what you suggested. Uh, Jeff Hawkins mentioned it last week too, and I just thought that was the best idea. If It makes the tag title match. It doesn't make it a marquee match, yes. but it makes it more of one. Yes, it does. Because you have such a big star in it in Braun Strowman. True. And Elias is ridiculously over. I don't know if that's the route they'll go, but if they do... I'm sure that will be entertaining as all hell. I, I can imagine them doing uh, the little musical segments where Elias is on the on the <laughs> just 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 picture this. Picture this. Elias is sitting on a stool with his guitar, Braun standing, you know, beside him with the double bass over his shoulder, and Elias is like strumming the guitar and kind of looking up at Braun, you know, like he could hit me anytime he wants, kind of thing. I think that would be grossly entertaining. If uh the headshots weren't illegal. I would love a concerto with the double bass and the guitar. <laughs> and just the the double bass engulfs the guitar. That'd be great. It That'd would be, be awesome. Yeah, so I, maybe I they're going to go in that direction. I think they can do some really entertaining stuff. And Sheamus has, I, w- I would argue that Sheamus has only been better once in his career, and that's when he was as a badass heel that didn't make jokes but other than that i think this is the best run of sheamus's career on screen and i i will give them credit sheamus and cesaro they've done a lot to solidify themselves as a team with the same gear and the same mannerisms and everything and you can tell that they're good buddies in real life and that's all good problem is i'm getting bored of the bar because Mm. it's the same thing every week even though again they've tried really hard to be a, a fluid tag team it's just the same stuff every week. I don't know. When when all the teams beat them up and Kurt Angle was like, yeah, well, you shouldn't have pissed them off. I was I was on the bar side. I'm like, they just want some competition. Right. That's it. Well, they're going like, to get that's, it. That's so wrong with that. Yeah, they are. And I, I agree with you about the marquee value because before Monday night, I didn't care about what the bar was doing at WrestleMania. Now I'm intrigued by what they're going to be doing at WrestleMania. And it's all because of Braun Strowman. So I think that'll be interesting. I want to read you a quote because I damn well disagree with this quote, Sean, and we'll see what you think. <laughs> this was on the uh, the March 3 edition of a radio show called All Things Wrestling. It's on Player FM, uh, and this is a quote by Dolph Ziggler, who was a guest on that radio show. Quote, okay. I'm not looking to prove anything. I just do what I do, and I watch everyone try to keep up with me. I could have been phoning it in for the last five years, and no one would have known, and that sucks, but it's true. Uh all due respect to Dolph Ziggler, you know, I have a lot of respect for pro wrestlers and the schedule they keep and the, the damage they do to their bodies. That is an absolute fallacy. You've been phoning yes. it in. You've been phoning it in for several years. You haven't changed anything about what you do. If anything, you have morphed more and more into Shawn Michaels, who is your idol. And all you've, do is em- all you've done is emulated him. You haven't really changed anything. Uh, so I think you have been phoning in and probably for the last five years. And, and to, to claim that you could have been but haven't and no one can keep up with me, it's just all, all bullshit. Yeah, yeah, I agree. agree. And WWE Creative hasn't does it, d- done him any favors either. No, they haven't. They haven't. But you know what? Sometimes you've got to make your own make your own chicken salad out of chicken shit, for lack of a better term. Yeah, it's true, Nigel. Throw throw some blueberry sauce on it, and you're good to go. It's true. Uh, I mean, Braun Strowman was dancing around the ring with uh, Adam Rose, and as soon as he got an opportunity by himself with the with the uh, who was it again? The White family. He mm-hmm. damn well made the best of it. And, you know, there's so many examples that you could look at. James Ellsworth is another one. Kevin Owens is another one. They get an opportunity and they run with that ball. And Who would have, uh, who would have thought that Bray Wyatt would be the worst off out of all the Wyatt family members at this point? Because Bludgeon Brothers had a kick-ass segment on SmackDown. It looks like they're in for a big push. Even though Harper did an interview saying he misses the jeans. Did you see that? I mean, hey, I get to work in my sweatpants a lot of days. I can, I can relate. Yeah, would you want to wrestle in blue jeans, though, man? I wouldn't want to wrestle in whatever. I wouldn't the hell want to wrestle in blue jeans now. Yeah, uh, but yeah, it's, just, it's just spandex, though, isn't it? It might be. I don't know. It depends on if they got the gimmick jeans or the work jeans. Like Dean Ambrose has gotten the the gimmick jeans. Harper's uh, look he, legit. They look legit. Yeah, they did look legit. They looked like he drops to a knee and he's got he's got some burns on him. After that. <laughs> It's like Cena has legit cargo shorts. Those are real. Like, you, you don't think he's developed somebody now that have some stretch to them? 
I well, I mean, you know, not that I, I look for, but yeah, I don't think there's been a whole lot of crotch uh, crotch issues with John Cena. So don't they don't know. have they don't have like a store where you all can just go buy gear in Canada, like just gimmicked gimmicked cargo shorts. I don't know, Nigel. Can you buy gimmick cargo shorts in Canada? I can't say that I've looked. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can find Taya in Canada, Impact Wrestling's Lucha Underground's. By the way, we will have those spoilers up. <laughs> Take a listen to Taya <laughs> talking about the Impact Wrestling Lucha Underground partnership. Uh, I really wanted to uh, hear the process of the Lucha Underground Impact partnership kind of coming about because a couple of years ago, that was definitely not the case. There was a pretty public issue with, with Hernandez. But uh, now you have the ability and do work for both Impact and Lucha Underground. So maybe kind of walk me through your reaction to hearing that news and how the process for you to work both uh, started. Um. I mean, yeah, it was definitely not an option a few years ago because we were very exclusively signed to Lucha Underground. Um, but there was a long period of, t- of downtime between season three and th- season four um, where I think a lot of people got a little antsy and, uh, you know, where we were all just really looking to, to keep working. You know, we wanted to keep moving forward with our careers and with our lives and things. And um, I had known Karen and Jeff Jarrett for years because they would come down to Mexico all the time and work for AAA. Um, and uh, they had always asked me to come and, and work for Impact, and I just didn't have the opportunity to. So when they asked me and John again, and all of a sudden, when we asked if we could go do this, there what the answer wasn't no anymore. It was just like this crazy moment. You're like, oh my gosh, this is really going to happen. Um, it was just it was a long time coming. I was wanting to you know work with them for so long, and Karen, Karen and Jeff were just so gracious and and allowing us to to start working there with them and being involved with impact and uh i just knew that i wanted to keep my character separate keep my character separate and really just bring some bring something different to that knockouts division so i'm just so blessed that i'm able to do both and now i'm you know the only woman on either roster that's you know involved on two different television series at the same time so it's really cool uh, you have worked with both Rosemary and Sexy Star in the past, and I know this situation is a little older, but uh, what were your feelings about how that went down, and uh, have you spoken to either of them about that situation since it did go down? Um, yeah, this I mean, this, is, this happened last August. Mm-hmm. I think I've been pretty I, – I said what I had to say when it first happened. Uh, I had worked with – you know, wrestled with Rosemary about – two weeks before that went down. Um, And that was my first experience with her in a ring and she's nothing but class. And uh, so when that happened, I was very, this was like I've said, I was just really disappointed. I, we're trying to make strides in women's wrestling. And sometimes I think we're each other's worst enemies. Sometimes, you know, it, it just was, it was just a really shitty situation that was, you know, I don't ever want to see anybody get hurt in that way. We're athletes, and, I, you know, we need each other as dance partners. I can't wrestle by myself. <laughs> Rosemary can't wrestle by herself. Sexy Star can't wrestle by herself. So we have to have a level of trust in each other that's so huge to just even get in the ring and face one another. So I just felt really disappointed. And obviously I've spoken to Rosemary um, since then. I have not spoken to Sexy Star at all. Um but, uh, you know, I think everyone's moved forward from that. And I think that, you know, we just have to remember that we don't want that to happen again. And uh, no one ever wants to see someone that's, you know, get hurt like that. I just, it's not cool. <laughs> that's pretty much all I can say about it. And we're back. Taya, Impact Wrestling Knockout, talking about the Lucha Underground Impact Wrestling uh, partnership and the show that's coming up, WrestleMania weekend. I'm going to talk to several people that are running uh, wrestling shows that weekend. Uh, I'm talking to Luke Hawks, who's running the Wildcat show. Hoping to talk to Joey Janela. I'm supposed to do this afternoon. And if the man will ever schedule anything with me, Matt Riddle, hit him up on Twitter. Say, hey, guys. Or say just say, hey, Matt. Hey, bro. Get your shit straight. <laughs> If you want, I can hit him up. He responds to me pretty pretty good. Oh, he responds to me. It just takes him four days. Then if I take a day to reply to him, 
He's, He's like, like, what's up, bro? Great delayed response, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. I want to talk about a story that actually came out a week ago, but uh, we ran out of time last week, so we never talked about it. Uh, PW Insider reported, again, about a week ago, that Alberto Del Rio was at WWE headquarters filming footage for some uh, upcoming network specials, and that while he was there, he met with Vince McMahon. So Alberto was one of these guys that still would go directly to Vince as opposed to to Hunter. Uh, a lot of the newer talent now, like Sasha Banks, will go right to Hunter and doesn't even have a relationship with Vince. Well, Alberto doesn't like Hunter. No, but, it is, but he's still yeah. an older school guy and yes. has that mentality. And, I mean, if it, if it was me, I'd go to Vince too, quite frankly. And uh, and so he goes to Vince. The point is is that he met with Mr. Man while he was there. You look at Alberto Del Rio, he looks like a champion. He carries himself, you know, on television or, you know, in, in, his, in his element, carries himself as a champion. We know that he's outside the ring a suspect. Do you think that Vince McMahon, because, again, Vince's decision-making these days is a little bit eh, do you think that he would bring Alberto Del Rio back knowing – his history, knowing that Paige is on the Raw brand, do you think there's any chance he'd bring him back? Yeah, I do think there's a chance, but and and I hate that this is the way that Vince McMahon thinks, but you know how he is. He's got to have his, his Hispanic star. That guy is Andrade Cien Almas. That being said, you can have more than one, but then again, it's the way that Vince thinks mm -hmm. is that you particularly have one. Like back in the day, it was Eddie Guerrero mm -hmm. and. Ray got like a smaller push, but don't forget Tito uh, Santana from a place that doesn't exist called Tacuba, uh, Mexico. Yeah, but yeah, I think he would, but I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't, wouldn't either. I wouldn't. Not either. at this point. It's it's gone wrong multiple times. I agree, and and it is too bad because he really does look like a champion, and and when he's, he's out just, there, especially his first run with the cars and with uh, Ricardo Rodriguez, he looked like a champion. He carried himself like a champion. He was believable at the top of the card. But I think there's too much, uh, too much baggage. I wouldn't bring him back either. But uh, that happened. They had a meeting, so I guess we'll see. One more thing before we get to some uh, some listener stuff here. Um, are you ready to see some commercials where Bailey says stuff like, "This is unhugging believable"? Are you ready for some commercials where Roman Reigns says, "I'd rather just hug it out"? Are you ready for stuff like that? You have any I've idea what I'm spending, talking about? I spent my entire life preparing myself for this moment. Do you know what I'm talking yes. about? I do not. So for the third year in a row, and again, this came out last week, but I just didn't, didn't have time to get to it. For the third year in a row, uh, they announced that they're doing a, a WrestleMania tie-in with Snickers. And that made me go back and look at some of the, the spots that they did previously. And don't forget, this is the same company that had Ric Flair dress up as Colonel Sanders. They had Dolph Ziggler wrestle a match as Colonel Sanders. They had Shawn Michaels dress up as Colonel Sanders. They had a battle royal to promote the Royal Rumble where everybody dressed up as Colonel Sanders. <laughs> and now... Uh, I rather enjoyed those, to be honest with you. I they some of them are really dumb. Some of them are really dumb. Yeah. The one with The Miz and Dolph Ziggler felt like it was 22 minutes long, that spot. Yeah, it did. Uh, so I went back and looked at some of the old Snicker stuff. And Roman Reigns was the poster boy for Snickers, as was Bailey. She was the poster girl, I guess, for Snickers last year, and uh, or maybe two years ago. And uh, she would say stuff like, "This is unhug and believable." Cutting a promo, Roman Reigns. Oh. Roman Reigns was doing the whole, you know, "You're not yourself," you know, "Have a Snickers" kind of thing. It's so poorly written and produced, and it's inevitable that we're going to be seeing a lot of that, especially WrestleMania week. So get ready for it. Who do you it. think writes those Snickers people or WWE people? I think it's a combination. Mm. I think. So let's get to, uh, I have a listener question. It's actually a good question. And I have a comment from a listener. And I want to do the comment you, first. You say it's actually a good question as if <laughs> the ones that we usually get are bad. All right, fair. They're always good questions. Otherwise, I wouldn't include them. So they're always good questions. But this, this one is, uh, I think it's an interesting topic. Uh, and we'll get to it. First, I have a comment. And this is from Jay Jr., and the comment is, you guys should set a chair for Nigel so we can actually see him laugh at everything like Ed McMahon used to for Johnny Carson. Ah. <laughs> hey, I mean. <laughs> now, I will say this. We are working on a new media room. It's probably not going to be ready until the summer. Uh, when that new media room is ready, there is a very good chance Nigel will be on camera. Nice. Very good chance. And I have even told so him this. This is the first time he's hearing it. But... 
There's a good chance. There's a good chance. So where is this media room, just for me, geographically, in the office? I can't comment on that. You why can't you comment on it? <laughs> because uh, let's just say that uh, I haven't put pen to paper yet, and so nobody in here knows. Okay. Okay. So you'll know soon. Matter of fact, I'm signing probably by the end of the day. Nice. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Breaking fightful news. There you go. So that's that. So this this uh, question, this is from Graham Williams, who uh, does a lot of graphics and stuff for us. He is incredible. Go follow him, guys. He said the back and forth between Sienna and Mark Andrews regarding wrestlers paying for their own flights. Any chance you could discuss it on the list on your boy? So let me first explain to people that don't know. So Sienna uh, wrestles for Impact Wrestling. Mark Andrews is a cruiserweight, uh, works for 205 Live and, and WWE's UK roster. He's on that roster. They had a back and forth on Twitter, and it started with Sienna basically posting on Twitter saying, if you're an independent wrestler and you're paying for your own flight for international shows, you're stupid, basically. Uh, Mark Andrews responded and said, I disagree, it's part of the hustle. And Gail Kim even chimed in and said, I agree with Sienna. Uh, basically, she said, I agree with Sienna, you should be paying for your own flights. So here's my take on it. It's dollars and cents. That's my yeah. take on it. And I'm going to be quite honest, and this is no dis- disrespect to Matt Riddle, but I've said to Sean a few times, Matt's always going to the UK. How is the promoter able to afford him when you're paying his payoff plus you're paying for his flight? I don't know if Matt's contributing to the cost of his flight. He might be. I don't know. I have an answer to that. Okay. He said, quote, they pay for it because I'm good at wrestling. Who the fuck pays for an international flight to work? That's crazy, bro. End quote. There you go. Beautiful. Beautiful. And I, I reached out to Shane Helms. And I reached out to Shane Helms for a specific reason. Shane Helms didn't get into pro wrestling as a former UFC fighter. Matt Riddle had that benefit of having a worldwide audience before this. And uh, Shane said it's it's common for when you're paying your dues and things like that. Uh, here's what he said. He said, I lean t- more towards Mark's side. A lot of people pay dues by paying their own trans when they're, n- when they're young and not over. And I said, does that change with international? I'm sure he's in a way different position than Sienna has ever been mm-hmm. for that since he's from overseas. Mm-hmm. And Shane said, maybe. Everybody's path is different. If someone is willing to work cheap just to learn or for the opportunity, I don't begrudge the talent. That happens in all forms of entertainment. Blame your promoters if you want to blame anybody. And uh, I mentioned uh, that about how he he came up. And he said, yeah, times are different now. Nobody was flying your ass when uh, I came up. That shit was ultra rare. And I mean – I can't remember. I can't remember if in the early 90s tickets were more expensive or less expensive. I just remember there being like some sort of drastic difference, me hearing about that. Do you know anything about that? They have discount airlines now, uh, mm-hmm. and a lot of them. I mean, there, there's one called Air Canada Rouge, and quite frankly, the reason that it's a discount airline is because they use old planes. Yeah. That's what they do. They use older planes that they would probably otherwise not use at all, and they just call it Air Canada Rouge, a discount airline. The way I look at it is, to me, it's strictly dollars and cents, and I look at it like – the promoter's got to make money. And yes. if he has to pay you a payoff in U.S. dollars, let's say he's based in, in Europe, he's got to pay you in U.S. dollars. He does have the benefit that the euro or the pound is higher than the U.S. dollar, so he's got to, he's got the advantage when it comes to that. But if he's also paying for your flight to get there, it's hard for me to fathom how they're going to make money on you. But that being said, let's say that you're a talent and you're from – wherever you're from the midwest u.s and you're trying to make a name for yourself and you've only done shows in front of 50 people and a, and a big promotion like ipw in uh in europe that can draw a thousand people offers you the opportunity to, to do a show but they need you to contribute to trans or take a lower payoff because it doesn't fit their budgets if you're that indie talent you're going to consider it because that's an opportunity to get in front of more eyeballs and they yep. have they have uh online they have an online presence too and so I look at it like it, it is part of the hustle. And with all due respect to Sienna, uh, she probably hasn't had to pay her dues the way that some other people have. And so she wouldn't really know the difference. It's, that's the kind of the world we live in. Gail Kim, Gail Kim came up at a time when it was kind of a different world too. She mostly did shows in the U.S. and Canada. You mostly drove from, from destination to destination. In Gail Kim's day, there wasn't a lot of flying to international shows yeah. until she made it to WWE and to, and to Impact Wrestling. So she's never really been in that situation either. But, well, Sienna, Sienna did pay her due. She worked for WSU and AIW, and she worked the Indies for a long time before she even got to Impact as their, their newest monster. And really, she's 
been the longest term one that they had. You know, Jessica Havoc washed out and Awesome Kong washed out and she's worked in that role and shown a little more versatility. And some of her in ring work I'm iffy on, but has she I done kinda, ha, has she done much international? Uh, you know, I'd have to look. I'd okay. I'd really have to look, but uh, I know she's done some in Canada at the very least. Probably drove. But and triple A. I, I know she did some triple A stuff because she teamed with Santana Garrett and cheerleader Melissa, but she is on Impact TV right now, so she shouldn't be paying for her own flights. No, she probably and, isn't. She probably yeah, isn't we, now. We joke about Impact Wrestling, but still there they are she is seen by three hundred thousand people every week, and that is something that a lot of these indie names would kill to have. Right. If Mark Andrews is still paying for his flights right now, I don't know what he's doing, because he's on WWE TV. He's not. So he better not be. No. But if you are coming up, paying your trans, that is something common. I mean, there, there, there are sacrifices you make in any line of work. I've mentioned it a lot of times. When I was coming up trying to make my name, mm -hmm. I established my experience any way I could. I taught kickboxing. I call. I did announcing for free. I did fight coordination for free. I managed a fight team and didn't take a cut. I mean, there have been things even – like ad, ad, like stuff with our ads and stuff, and you've said, "Oh, I'll give you a cut," and I said, "No, let's put that towards us going into the black." Like, this, just you make sacrifices in order for the better of your career and things of that nature. If Sienna doesn't see that as a positive for her career, mm -hmm. don't take it. But if somebody is able to or willing to take a wash on a payday to get that experience, and who knows how many bookings it will lead to before Bill After worked for him for free mm -hmm. for a long time. Did, I mean, didn't he recommend me to you? He did. That paid off. Yeah. That paid off for me. It's still up for debate. Happy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's ultimately, yeah. <laughs> I thought you meant the situation. Yeah. Took, it took a few seconds for the light bulb to go off. I hit this <laughs> red button here on Skype. <laughs> <laughs> so have you uh, planned out your Tim Hortons, McDonald's, whatever's going to be the letter that you send out? Have you planned that all out yet? Well, first off, I have to find out when I'm coming back to Toronto. You know what I'm saying? No, you can do it locally. Just look for any kind I want, of. Uh... No, I want to get good Toronto Tim Hortons. I'm not getting some Kentucky trash Tim Hortons. But why don't you just look for look for any kind of promotional tie-in at any kind of retail establishment because where I'm you're at? Because I'm not lazy and I'm looking for an excuse to come back. Oh, I see. He I already see. told me he was going to make the push. Just so you know. Oh, did he? Yes. Oh. <laughs> He said he said he was gonna make the push for it to happen. Oh, that's Put good to know. On the spot, B. Ah, oh, it's one of my sales guys. For those that don't know, that's good to know. <laughs> a damn good one too. Yeah, he is. He but, is. But yeah, I'm I'm going. I I need those coupons. I need those sweet coupons. Were the, just let me, give me a taste. Were they glossy? Was it? Was yeah, it was paper? actually it was actually a full color book. <laughs> Ooh. A full color cripple book. McDonald's actually they they gave me what looked like black and white printouts. Probably recyclable paper. They're big on that. Might have been, might have been. But Tim Hortons gave me a, a, actually a full color book. And Tim Hortons don't give a fuck. They're just making. It <laughs> They're like coupons, coupons, coupons. Mm. <laughs> Not caring about the environment. Anything else you got, Jimmy? Uh, that's it. There was something I was going to mention, but I forget what it was now. So I guess probably there's nothing the major. probably the post NXT show I'm starting to do weekly now. That's hot mm. on the streets. Got that on FightfulWrestling.com this weekend. The interview from last year, the full interview with Jack Swagger that I did drops. Uh, you all will get to listen to that in its entirety. It was in uh, some segments on the list in your boy. Also, Fightful alternate commentary, myself and Anna Bauer talking the Hogan Warrior WrestleMania 6 match at the Sky Dome. Yeah. What a tie-in. I love that match. I know that you said, oh, it's dog shit, but I actually really liked it. Uh, dog shit would be giving it credit. Kind of like the Mixed Match Madness. <laughs> A wonderful idea, as I as I always said. I don't know why you naysayed it so much. <laughs> pancakes are better than waffles. You're high as a. F I'm gonna have some pancakes if and when I come back to Toronto. I have to see what the fuss is about. Like, you better do some scouting. I want you like out on the ramp, like some managers do for wrestlers. I want you rolling into like pancake joints, taking notes. Like, this one will impress SRS. This is the one that will convince him. They're better than waffles. That's what I need to do. That's what you need to do. You've yeah. got a few days <laughs> off, right? This week I do, actually. I, 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 yeah, I have the evenings to myself until Saturday. Well, 
I just planned them for you. Yesterday was glorious. I watched my first full hockey game all season. Really? Yes. It's beautiful. Damn. They Edmonton Oilers lost the game. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, please leave us a thumbs up. Please subscribe. We have some premium content coming your way soon. We will announce it very soon. Uh, lots of cool stuff over at Fightful.com and FightfulWrestling.com. We are your leader in crossover combat sports coverage. If you don't like MMA or boxing, just head over to FightfulWrestling.com. Until then, until next time, follow Jimmy Van at JimmyVan74. Follow me at Sean Ross Sapp. Follow us at Fightful Online. Follow Nigel. Nigel's on Twitter. Yep. At Nigel, how do I pronounce the Lokai, the right? Lokai. Lokai. Yeah. Nigel underscore Lokai. Until next time, we're out.